This is Christian Bale in the movie The Big Short, stomping around barefoot, listening to death metal, and making billions of dollars by betting that America's housing market was essentially a Jenga tower made of wet spaghetti. But at the very end of that movie, there is kind of this horror movie ominous text that pops up right at the end that a lot of people didn't really think about. It says something along the lines of, Michael Burry is now investing in water. And if you saw that, you probably thought, oh, that's weird, why water? Is he buying like a Brita filter empire or something? Does he own the Poland spring water right now? Is he hoarding Evian bottles in his garage like it's the world's least fun Costco run? But nope, it wasn't any of those meme things. He was dead serious on this. Burry looked at the global economy. He looked at the housing crash that he just profited from. He looked at the looming crises of the future and said, the next big bubble is the lack of good quality H2O. And that sounds insane until you realize that humanity has spent the last 50 years treating water like it's an infinite freebie, as if God himself had signed a lease agreement that included unlimited refills at the soda fountain and well, he didn't. So here's the problem. You may think, but wait, Earth is literally covered in water. Isn't this like running out of sand in the Sahara Desert? Well, yes it is, except for the vast majority of it is salt water, which we cannot drink. Only about 2.5% of Earth's water is fresh, and most of that is locked away in glaciers or buried underground, basically inaccessible unless you're an evil Bond villain with a giant, giant drill. What we actually can use amounts to just 1% of the Earth's water. One. One percent. That's not a lot. That's the liquid equivalent of getting a full Costco-sized pizza and being told you're only allowed to eat just the crust bubbles. I mean, what's the point of that? But guess what? We're guzzling through that one percent like frat boys on a keg. The UN estimates that nearly 2 billion people already lack access to safe drinking water, and over half a billion live with chronic water scarcity. Which is insane because water isn't like gold or oil, it's not optional. You can live without Bitcoin, but you cannot live without water. I mean, you can try, but you'll die pretty quickly, actually. But here's where the modern world makes it even dumber. Because just as water supplies are shrinking, we've invented new ways to make the crisis even worse. And those new ways are, surprise, surprise, powered by the same geniuses building our future. So first of all, for data centers, those enormous server warehouses that run Netflix, Google, Amazon, ChatGPT, and probably the FBI file your mom swears doesn't exist on her computer, these things are water vampires. A single data center can use up to 5 million gallons of water a day for cooling. 5 million gallons per day. That's enough to supply a city of 50,000 people or, and I checked this, to fill 7,500 Olympic-sized swimming pools every single year. Also, you can keep watching Love is Blind in 4K without buffering, and to be fair, that might be a good trade-off. And so those were data centers before AI came along. You see, training one large AI model can directly evaporate 700,000 liters of water. Think about that. Every time you ask an AI to write your Tinder bio or generate a picture of Pikachu wearing a tuxedo, somewhere a server is basically boiling off a swimming pool. And it gets worse. Projections suggest that by 2027, AI-related water withdrawals could hit 6.6 .6 billion cubic meters. That's about half of the entire UK's annual water use. And keep in mind, the UK is full of tea drinkers. That's like threatening the very foundation of their national identity. And because humans are somewhat stupid, where are we building most of these data centers? Well, in water-stressed regions. Because of course we are. Because why wouldn't we? It's the same logic as saying, you know, where we should build an ice factory in the middle of the Sahara Desert. That's perfect. Makes total logical sense. I mean, Google plopped a data center in a drought-stricken Chile that slurped up 100 million gallons per year. Locals basically said, sorry, Google, you don't get to take all the water to cool your YouTube cat videos while our crops die. Meanwhile, in Spain, Amazon's new facilities were licensed to use that could otherwise irrigate 233 hectares of corn. Instead, that water will now keep Jeff Bezos' servers cool enough to process your Alexa requests for fart noises. I've never done that before. Definitely. Never. Although those requests are fair and they are very important, but maybe not starving a farming region type of important. 
In 2020, a private equity firm named Water Asset Management, yes, that's actually their name, not a Bond villain shell company, well, they began quietly buying up farmland in Colorado, and then Arizona, and California for good measure. But not because they love kale or are secretly passionate about artisanal quinoa. No, they wanted water rights. These farms sit on top of critical aquifers, and whoever owns the land owns the water, so it's less farm to table and more farm to faucet. And this is not some fringe play from this company. In California's Kern County, where most of the country's pistachios, almonds, and grapes come from, the price of water rights has jumped by more than 300% since the 1990s. Farmers are being outbid by hedge funds that don't care about crops. They just want to flip water like it's beachfront property. Meanwhile, in Australia, the water market is so financialized that hedge funds literally trade water futures like they're betting on horses. Macquarie Bank dumbed the vampire kangaroo because it eats everything in its path, made hundreds of millions speculating on water trades. And yes, this sounds insane, but it is true. Billionaires in Sydney are gambling on whether or not a farmer in the Murray-Darling Basin will have enough water to grow food this year. And that's because when you say Wall Street is betting on your future, you usually mean figuratively, but here it means literally. And then there's also the ultimate bad guy of this video, and that is... Nestle. Oh yes, we're going there. Don't think I forgot about you, Nestle. So, Nestle has been accused for years of extracting water at laughably cheap rates, bottling it and selling it back to you at a profit that would make a cartel man blush. In Michigan, they were permitted to pump 400 gallons per minute from local aquifers while paying the state a permit fee of just $200 per year. Two hundred dollars that's less than a gym membership and yet they get to drain a community's water supply like aquaman having a bad hangover locals protested lawsuits were filed nestle just shrugged and people are still busy buying poland spring water and even sovereign wealth funds are in on it i mean saudi arabia's almeida company bought up farmland in arizona to grow alfalfa a notoriously thirsty crop, and then exported it back to Saudi Arabia to feed cows. So yes, Arizona water was literally shipped overseas, embedded in hay bales, so Saudi dairy cows could have dinner. And honestly, that just sounds like the worst possible use for Arizona's dwindling groundwater, apart from a bunch of lonely men buying bathwater online from OnlyFans creators. And let's not forget Wall Street's new favorite toy, which is water futures. In December of 2020, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange launched the world's first water futures market tied to California's water supply. The logic was that it would help farmers hedge against price volatility. But the reality is that it turned the single most important resource for life into something that you can just YOLO trade from your Robinhood app while scrolling and eating chips. What are you in this week, Chad? Oh, just Tesla, Bitcoin, and you know, the literal survival of humanity in a local region. The irony is that while the rich are hedging their bets, ordinary people are already paying the price. In Cape Town, South Africa, the city nearly hit day zero in 2018 when taps would have literally run dry. Wealthy homeowners had private boreholes drilled, while poor neighborhoods queued at communal taps. In California, residents faced restrictions while golf courses remain green. In Mexico City, the taps in working-class districts routinely sputter dry, while the wealthy and upscale neighborhoods still get flowing showers. In Cochabamba, Bolivia, by the way, great city name, when Betchel privatized the water system in 1999 and raised rates, protests erupted so fiercely it led to deaths and the eventual expulsion of the company. Now just imagine explaining to your kids, sorry honey, we can't afford water this month, but don't worry, daddy bought some sweet water ETFs instead. And as long as we hodl, we'll be all good. So here's the thing, is that this isn't some dystopian future, it's happening right now and has been happening. Hedge funds own farms for the aquifers. Multinationals bottle groundwater for pennies and then resell it for dollars. Wealthy nations import water indirectly by buying up crops from poor, dry countries. And Wall Street has literally turned your drinking water into a line item on a trading screen. And so far, this story is what you would hear all around about the dwindling supply of water. But maybe this isn't the entire story. Maybe there is another path that humanity is going down already. And maybe the way to invest in water is not through buying up farmland. 
Maybe it's through something else. So, so far we've gone from Michael Burry whispering water like a Bond villain in a basement, to hedge funds and Nestle sucking aquifers dry, to golf courses in Arizona somehow being greener than in the Amazon. And the question becomes, what the hell do we do when the fresh water runs out? Well, enter desalination. The idea is simple. Take seawater, filter out the salt, and presto, drinkable water. It's the ultimate life hack for a lot of people, the infinite refills solution. It sounds amazing, right? Except, of course, it's hideously expensive, for now. It's energy hungry and produces giant piles of salt brine that have been dumped all over the place. So a good example for this is everyone's favorite country right now, and that is Israel. By 2023, Israel got over 80% of its domestic water supply from desalination plants. The country basically looked at the Mediterranean Sea, said, mine, and started drinking it. They've turned a literal desert into a functioning hydrated society using giant ocean two cup machines. It's actually somewhat of a miracle while also being terrifying because it shows exactly what the future might look like with the countries having essentially giant straws plugged into the ocean. Saudi Arabia has gone even further. They've invested billions into desalination. Some of the largest plants on Earth actually sit on the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. One single Saudi plant produces more than 1 million cubic meters of water a day, enough to supply 3 million people. Or, you know, one Kardashian skincare routine. And it's not just the Middle East. California has been building desalination plants like it's preparing for Mad Max Pacific Edition. The Carlsbad desalination plant completed in 2015 cost $1 billion and now churns out more than 50 million gallons of water daily. And if you're wondering, who owns that? Well, surprise, private investors with guaranteed profit margins. Because, of course, the one thing more refreshing than cold water is warm returns on capital. Sweet, sweet cash. Globally, the desalination industry is exploding. In 2000, there were 12,500 plants worldwide. By 2022, that number was over 20,000, producing more than 100 million cubic meters of water a day. And the world is on track to have 25,000 plants pretty soon. It'll be enough to meet the needs of 350 million people. By 2030, the market is projected to hit $35 billion a year, becoming one of the fastest growing industries in the world. But here's where things get messy. Desalination is more of a lifeline right now, and it's not evenly distributed. Rich nations can afford the massive upfront costs. Poor nations cannot, which means we could easily see a future where wealthy countries are slurping purified seawater from high-tech facilities, while poor countries are left fighting over shrinking rivers. A world where Monaco is basically a sparkling oasis, and just across the Mediterranean, people are rationing buckets. Which, to be honest, sounds less like global cooperation and more like a setup for a really bad, depressing, dystopian Netflix series. And so, investors and billionaires, they see this and their pupils turn into dollar signs. Bill Gates has invested in water tech startups, Elon Musk has flirted with water purification projects while casually wasting thousands of gallons hosing down his Cybertruck prototypes, hedge funds are circling desalination infrastructure like vultures in Patagonia Invests, and why? Because if you own the machines that turn seawater into drinking water, you don't just own a business. You own the tap, and whoever owns the tap controls life itself. So, this was Michael Burry's hypothesis from the beginning. In the 20th century, oil was the resource wars were fought over. In the 21st century, it could be water. Unlike oil, there's no alternative to water. You can switch to solar panels instead of gasoline or hydrogen instead of oil, though you cannot switch to Diet Coke instead of water. Trust me, I've tried. I've been on some really nice Diet Coke binges. It's not so good for you. So maybe Michael Burry may be right. After mortgages, after tech, after crypto, the final bubble may be water itself. And if you think that sounds ridiculous, just remember, somewhere out there right now, a hedge fund manager is staring at the Pacific Ocean and seeing profits, dollar signs, and a balance sheet. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click on my documentaries playlist to see more videos like this. And I'll see you guys in my next video when you click on it in just a few seconds.